Let's go back, 2020. What a year to learn the rules of the road when there was really nowhere to go and hardly any traffic. So last year, I decided to resume my daughter's driving lesson. I say resume because we had been at it twice before and it hadn't gone so well. <laughs> so I figured third time's a charm. Plus, we needed a bright spot in the dark tunnel of the COVID-19 pandemic and our country's reckoning on race. So this day, we set out for Ingersoll Avenue, easy win. I remember telling my daughter on repeat to glance over your shoulders, check your mirrors, don't forget your blind spots. Be aware of yourself and other drivers. She was following the car behind us just fine, my husband. Now he's got a lead foot. So as his speed increased, she couldn't keep up. She got nervous. My nerves were on 10, and then just ahead, we noticed construction. We hadn't anticipated the structural disrepair, potholes, detours, roadblocks, obstacles, which existed even in the absence of other vehicles. My daughter forgot everything I told her to be aware of. And as we approached an intersection, she swerved into the bike lane and said, at least I didn't hit anything. <laughs> the bike lane, a literal margin on the road to allow for cyclist mobility, a margin not wide enough for motor vehicle use, but a margin just wide enough for cyclists to compete. Hmm. My daughter and I were relieved that the bike lane was clear. A cyclist in the bike lane would have meant a nasty collision. The million dollar question is, would a cyclist have survived the bike lane with our swerves and structural disrepair? And if they did survive with injury, how would they be made whole? Of course, we would have been held legally responsible for damages and making the cyclist whole. But that still doesn't address the road construction. Now, if you've ever been on a road like this, like Ingersoll, a road that's constantly under repair, under construction, in the name of progress, you know a cyclist is no match for a motor vehicle, let alone structural disrepair. A pothole to a car is annoying, <laughs> but to a cyclist, a pothole is detrimental to their mobility. Despite my best efforts and precisely when it mattered most, both my daughter and I were unaware of the bike lane. Now, driving lessons were not the only things happening in 2020. 2020 was also the year Iowa got her wake-up call. The coronavirus pandemic hit the elderly and essential workers the hardest, disproportionately impacting black and brown communities. Almost 6,000 Iowans have died. A land hurricane called the derecho, remember that? Swept through central and eastern Iowa. Cedar Rapids was knocked off the grid. 65% of Cedar Rapids tree canopy was destroyed. And the nation, the world, saw a black man's final breath blend into the atmosphere in a tragic encounter with law enforcement, sparking calls for justice with the fierce urgency of now. The criminal legal system, the economy, agriculture, our learning institutions, hospitals, housing, our systems barely held. We have to question the, the integrity of our public infrastructure. But before that can be done, we have to understand how we got here. Questions like, how do we respond to structural disrepair? How do structural failures and our responses to them impact people? And then how do we radically address repair? You see, a pandemic won't go away on its own. You can't put a Band-Aid on Cedar Rapids. And you can't respond to a race reckoning with unassailable cultural narratives. Let me explain. Unassailable, well, that means 
indisputable, undeniable. If something is unassailable, then it can't be disproven. It is bulletproof, unassailable. Cultural, meaning group thinking, our shared interests, our shared beliefs, our shared attitudes. Think about like the Borg in bulletproof vests. Unassailable cultural narrative. Narrative meaning a story, just a story, but a story that if repeated often enough becomes true, at least in the minds of those who experience it and those who believe it. So an unassailable cultural narrative is our bulletproof shared story. Our most popular bulletproof shared story is Iowa Nice. It's the claim that Iowans are tolerant and benevolent. Strangers can count on our individual goodness and that this is the best place to live, move, and be. Iowa Nice, our bulletproof shared story. Say it with me, Iowa Nice. The most legit account of Iowa Nice, in my opinion, occurred in 1975 when Governor Robert Ray established the first state-operated resettlement agency post-Vietnam War, allowing refugees from Northwest Vietnam to call Iowa their new home, sealing our unassailable cultural narrative, Iowa Nice. The thing about a bulletproof shared story like Iowa Nice is that it's not actually bulletproof. There's a hole in the Kevlar. While Iowa rolled out the welcome mat for one people who so desperately needed refuge, the Federal Aid Highway Act and the construction of I-235 were wiping out thriving black communities like those that comprised the Center Street Black Business District in Des Moines. So why do Iowans fuel a bulletproof shared story that is only true for some? What exactly is the fuel at the center. The fuel, the problem, nestled comfortably in the same spaces that consider Iowa nice a prevailing wisdom is the problem of whiteness at the center. Whiteness. Whiteness. What is whiteness? Whiteness is the normalizing of white as the standard bearer that all other groups are compared to. People who identify as white are positioned, centered, to have advantages on the road. And these racialized advantages allow for swerves like Iowa nice in the face of structural disrepair, perpetuating racism. Racism exists wherever it is welcome. And ladies and gentlemen, racism is welcome in the heartland. This is how we know. The median income for black household annually in Iowa is nearly half the state average, $31,992 a year compared to $61,691. In 2019, US News and World Report ranked Iowa third best affordable place to live. But that same year, 53% of Black Polk County couldn't afford to pay their rent. Iowa is named 2020 number one state, best state for opportunity. Yet Iowa is ranked the second worst state in the nation for Black people to live. Iowa nice is harmful because it is not universally true. The whiteness at the center of our bulletproof shared story swerves people into the margins. And I know about life in the margins. As a first generation Iowan, my life was shaped by the loving guidance of a family who migrated here from Jim Crow, Mississippi in the early 1970s. My mother tells me she was not excited. <laughs> she wanted to stay in Mississippi because it was the only home she'd ever known. 
but poverty forced them to flee before I was born. My family had heard stories about booming black utopias like Buxton, Iowa of days past, and they'd heard that Center Street was sort of a revival, and that's where they were headed. The night they arrived in Des Moines, their route brought them to the East Side Bridge, and my mother says when she saw the city lights from downtown, optimism began to set in. And that was a big deal for a small town country girl. And even today, when my mother drives over that bridge at dusk, she gets sentimental. But what greeted my family when they crossed over the bridge to the other side was employment discrimination, lack of access to resources, and a housing crisis after 235. The Center Street Business District was no more. My mother and father found out that in a sense, they never really left Mississippi. That perhaps what Brother Malcolm X said was true, as long as you are south of the Canadian border, you are south. They were just in the Iowa section. My family and so many others was relegated to the margins, colliding at a three-way intersection of race, class, and the cultural narratives that attracted them to Iowa in the first place. Opportunity, jobs, a better life, and the unassailable Iowa nice. Iowa nice makes us captive to a notion that's either aspirational at its best or at its worst, a dangerous standard. And history and data have shown that black Iowans constantly toggle between the aspiration and the danger. A community conversation must be held about whiteness, fueling a narrative that keeps marginalized people in general and black people in particular on the receiving end of structural disrepair. You see, the road is a dangerous place for a cyclist. That's why we have bike lanes. Yet cyclists are in just as much danger if a driver responds to disrepair with a swerve. Iowa nice is the swerve that marginalized black Iowans come face to face with and whiteness is at its center. Iowa nice gives majority culture drivers isolating, plausible deniability of the structural fails that are built into every single system that governs the well-beings of Iowans. Iowa nice is our unassailable cultural narrative, but if we keep accepting it as a bulletproof shared story, that means at least I didn't hit anything. That means we'll continue to acknowledge the perceived good intentions of individual drivers while disregarding the oppressive roadblocks that informed the realities of marginalized black Iowans. Maintaining Iowa nice as our bulletproof shared story means that we will forsake the detours of discrimination and the potholes of inequity. A friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, told me a story about a black man who was recently released from prison. DNA evidence exonerated him from the crime he was accused of, and after spending all of those years confined, this man said that there really is no freedom. There is only free from. Hmm. I think it's time that we free ourselves up from the captivity of the unassailable Iowa nice as a cultural narrative. We gotta let it go. I know a little something about getting too free from. As I stand before you, you are witnessing a human, a woman, a black woman from Iowa on a journey to understand the ideals, how the ideals of majority culture impede people in the margins, in the bike lane. People in the bike lane want to know what life is like beyond the margin. What is life like without the debilitating swerve of Iowa nice? This is awareness. And that awareness 
stirs an affection for what matters. Awareness arouses curiosity and a yearning to become familiar with the unknown. Awareness. The road was meant to be shared. And now you'll never be able to say again, I wasn't aware. You can't unknow the bike lane now. You can't unknow that people do exist in that space and have a very different reality than your own. Black people are in the bike lane. Either we continue on navigating in structural and social disrepair the way things have been, or we snatch our confidence from unassailable cultural narratives which are fueled by whiteness and commit to action, repairing the road and making whole the people who have been injured. Structural and social disrepair hurts all of us. Eddie Merck, a famous cyclist, says, when it's hurting you, that's when you can make a difference. And if you swerve, and hit me, it will hurt you. I don't have all the answers, but I do know that we cannot stay in a state of constant awareness of the bike lane, of the marginalized, of the margin, without moving toward action and accountability. So what will you do? when you hear Iowa nice, what will you do? Thank you.